All right, let's do a little bit with the bassoon now. Uh, I'd like to illustrate a couple of things. Um, first of all, if the reed is uh, properly soaked, and remember, we're going to soak it in the soaking cup. The whole reed is wood, therefore it needs to be completely immersed, the entire length of it. I don't have quite enough water in this cup to soak the entire length of it. So I would soak it that way for a little while, and then I would turn it upside down, make sure the other end gets soaked adequately. Uh, it will only seal and crow like it should if it's adequately soaked. And again, it's 8 to 10 minutes if it's dry to give it a good chance to get really soaked. I've already soaked this reed, so I don't need to leave it that long, but... Uh, Let me illustrate, though, that if I've got, if the reed's working properly, with my whole mouth over it, not holding an embouchure at all, okay, decent. So then when I go with the embouchure, it should crow also. And really, if I just barely blow on it, I just get a single pitch. If I go just a little bit harder, we should hear an octave. Have we heard the octave? Then if I blow a bit harder, it opens up into the other overtones. There's my crow. I want the reed to crow uh, like that. If it isn't crowing properly, it may not be soaked right. It may not be open enough, it could be too closed, or it may not be scraped right. So to check if the entire reed is working without me, I'll put the whole thing in the mouth. I got a good crow with the whole reed, but with the reed embouchure. I want it to crow without me holding an embouchure to make sure the reed's crowing well. To make sure that it's not me. All right. So anyway, so we've we've got the reed crowing. Now, what if it won't crow? If I don't have enough reed in my mouth, it'll just be a high pitch. If I have my jaw too closed, it needs to drop down. Draw jaws drop. I won't get the presence of those rich overtones, so I have a really nice con overtone content in my tone, unless I have the embouchure set so that the reed is still crowing. All right, what's that, what's that taking? All right, step one, I want the jaw to be open. So I'm dropping the jaw in a vertical way. Then I bring the reed in, double lip. I roll the lower lip over the teeth, and the upper tip lift over the T. There's a double lip armature to cushion both plates from the from the T. Then I want to focus on getting round. It's the drawstring closure again. Pull the strings, come in round. Every time I do that, you can't see it. But I'm round. And I am vertical. My jaw is dropped wide. And then I'm bringing in the round circular closer around it with the double lip. I'm taking almost the entire scrape part of my mouth, almost up to that first wire. I'm aware that there are people teaching to take less than that now. But that's the school I was raised in, is to take the whole scrape part of the mouth. And that's where it crows, which makes sense to me for getting that rich overtone content in your tone. Okay, so if I'm not getting the crow, I'm either too closed. I'm too almost too clarinet-like. Or I'm not taking enough reading in the mouth. closed and, and, and not quite enough reed in the mouth, I'm just going to get that high pitch. The whole trick is to open a, open a hole, fill it in with double lip, and come in around the reed in a round way, and dropped. 
keep the, re reassert the drop. We start with the drop. And then we reassert the drop as we start to play. Make sure that it is, the teeth should be open as much as possible. Okay. And then, uh, so if it won't crow, I put a, a list of factors in the book. Uh, it may be that the reed doesn't crow properly in the first place. It's just reed isn't doing very good. Uh, or it may be that I'm too close to mouth, or I don't have enough reed in the mouth. So I, I want the crow with the embouchure. I also have to be sure that the air is warm. Not This doesn't use the cold air stream like the oboe or the clarinet. Throat is open and relaxed, deep. Is that low out of his apple position? I want to crow the reed. This is my little bassoon development process now. I want to crow the reed for about four or five minutes a day. Get that crow, rich crow happening. That'll help me set my embouchure up. Then I'm going to put it on the vocal. And notice I'm starting with the with the reed about a quarter of a turn around, so that when I put it in, when I put it in, I just twist and push. Now it's seated on there, it's not gonna fall off. I can't even pull it off very easily. I'd have to twist it to pull it off. Now I'm just gonna play the reed with the vocal only. I'm gonna try to do this like I'm still doing exactly the same crow. If I do that well, it'll be about a B. I don't want to change my embouchure to bring it up to the C that I want. The pitch should be a C. If it's, if it's playing a B, that means I did the crowing pretty well and I'm, I'm open and relaxed and things are working like they should. I don't want to change that. All I want to do is support it with my stomach up to the C. I'm not changing my embouchure. I'm not biting harder. I'm not lipping it up. I'm simply supporting it up. You can get about a B to a C sharp. Where do we want to be in the middle on the C? Not up there. That's going to give me the right embouchure pressure versus air pressure. And it takes a lot more from the stomach than you would think. It's a very physical instrument. So I would play the crow for about five minutes, and then I would play it with just the vocal and get used to where that feels, how that feels to play the C with the vocal. I do that for another minute or two. I'm not near the piano or we'd check that pitch, but I'm sure it's a C. Then I'm gonna put it on the bassoon. And the first note I'm gonna play is the C. Still a little, not rotated. I guess we were playing more there. Then go from there. See if you can keep that same basic approach in your embouchure and the feeling of the support and air. I found this is one of the best ways to stabilize the pitch and get a good tone on the bassoon. So again, my little process is crow the reed until you've got a good open, sol good amateur, good open feel in your oral cavity, solid air. <clears throat> then put it on the vocal, support it up to a C. It'll be a B if you do that about, if you do it right, it'll be a B, support it up to a C. Then put it on the bassoon, play your C. Then expand into the scale of the chord from there. And by the way, I've soaked that reed until it's sealing. I, I didn't show you this, but it should pass the suction test. I don't know if it will. Yeah, <laughs> please. Doesn't feel bad. Hopefully it will. I'm going to seal off the end of it. And it is leaking. Mm. Now, if it's leaking, it may need a new coat of Duco cement. This is the Duco cement. This way. 
and I can coat the whole bottom part with Duco cement. We don't usually coat between the first and second wires. Uh, with a young student, I might in a tough situation. I'm, I guess I need to maybe reseal this around the bottom. It's been it's an old rig. Uh, but we can reseal it if we need to with the Duco cement. Now, uh, there, there are a few uh, specialized techniques on the bassoon that I probably should share with you. And you can find more things on these instruments on the internet, on YouTube, and so on. All right, now, the E flat is very unstable. This note. So everybody in the bassoon world puts does what we call the long E flat. What I'm doing is I'm putting down, bring this down a little bit more. I'm putting down my middle finger and my thumb B flat key with the E flat. The E flat is one and three. I'm putting down the middle finger and the thumb B flat. Some bassoons might work better with the first finger and the thumb B flat. Some people get into putting down one of these little keys, little finger keys over here. I don't think it helps much, I don't bother. Uh, so one, three, five, and the thumb B flat key is what I normally use. Works well on this instrument. And here how it stabilizes. That's a critical thing to know on the bassoon. Uh, another thing that's while I'm here, it's worth checking. Does the E sink? If you push it hard, it might sink. You can get that back in an emergency situation by putting down finger number six, your third finger on your bottom hand. It'll bring it right back, little known secret. Uh, but the real fix for that is in the reed. If it sinks, now I'm not, I don't, I'm deliberately making that sink. This reed doesn't sink much, but if it sinks, it's a little too thin right in the middle of the tip up here. And I might be able to fix that by readjusting the wires, or I might be able to fix that by clipping off the tip just a little bit. And then I might have to rework a little bit on the sides, but I want to, I wouldn't take out more in the middle because I want to get the middle thicker. If it's sinking, it's because that middle is a little too thin. And if it, if it's sinking, if it's bad, the C sharp will, will sink too. But so when I'm making a read, I'll, I'll test both of those notes. I want that to stay up to pitch. If it's not, I got to work on the tip. And I want the E flat to be as stable as possible without the long fingering. And that's in the back of the reed. I've, I've got some diagrams in the book of where I would scrape for that. But the side, the back sides is where that lives. All right, so that's the long E flat. Uh, flicking. This is an interesting thing and difficult to demonstrate. But the whisper key doesn't really perform, perform the function of an octave key exactly. So I'm, I'm holding the whisper key down on all the low notes. But you see it moving right here? That's called the whisper key. I open it and it doesn't make it go up. So what do I have to do to make it go up? I have to muscle it up. But you hear there's an unhappy sound in the middle there. It's not a clean change. So we do what we call flicking to get that sound where it's clean. Now flicking's done with the thumb. I'm going to try to turn around a little bit here. See if we can zero in where you can see the back. Hopefully this is working. So what I'm doing is I'm, this is my whisper key. I'm bringing my thumb up and hitting one of these keys. Now, it doesn't matter which one you hit. Touch it, get off of it. That's why it's called flicking. I just touch it. It performs the function of an octave key, but we don't hold it down like we would an octave key. It's breaking the uh, hold an anti-node and making it go up. Uh, if I was to hold these keys down, there is a breakdown that this, this, would, this key would work for the A and the B flat. This key would work for the B and the C, and this key would work for the D. But I'm not, we're not typically holding it down. 
typically we're just flicking. And so if you're flicking, it doesn't matter which of these keys you hit. It does matter that you don't hit the key just above the whisper key. This is the C sharp key, and that will put it up a half step. Could even use that as a trill key. We don't want to use. We don't want to do that. So I've got to take my finger off the whisper key and skip the C sharp key, and then hit one of these upper keys. I don't need to flick C sharp because it's a weird enough fingering that it speaks by itself. But I, I do uh, flick if I'm going to those notes. Now this is all written out in the book, but. The notes are the A at the top of the steps, on the top line of the step, A, B flat, B, C, and D. Those notes will all be flicked if I'm going from an interval and I'm slurring. And even if I go down to the note or up to the note, let's say I'm going from a high F down to, down to A. Didn't want to speak, so I'll flick it. So even if I'm going up to down to it, I'll, I'll flick. Or, whatever note. So if we're coming from an interval, usually of a fourth or greater, uh, and if we're slurring, then we do that. We don't, we really don't need to tongue. I mean, if we're tonguing, we don't need to flick because the tonguing will break the air column and help it happen. And if we're going from a very short distance, I won't need to flick that. Um, <clears throat> So that, that's just something you're going to need to know about if you're going to get into the bassoon. Your thumbs stay pretty busy on the bassoon. There's a thing like that, I'll show you this on the front, that we call slur fingerings. There are three high notes that don't speak like they should. So I'm going to the high E. If I'm slurring to that, nicely, but if I leave off the first, first finger of the bottom hand, it'll make that slur up there and speak nice. Uh, the same is true for the E flat. First finger down on the, on the bottom hand normally, two on the top, three on the bottom. Leave off finger number four, your first finger on the bottom, and it'll slur to it if you're going from an interval. And one other note that's like that is the high F sharp. And it doesn't matter really which of the F sharp fingerings you're using. There's several fingers you could use. But the, for that fingering, if I want to slur, I leave off finger number three. So finger number three for high F sharp, finger number four for high E flat or E. Those are the notes that require slur fingerings. That's a real oddity. Maybe nobody will tell you about it, so I, I, I'll mention it here. The bassoon also has some interesting fingering problems in it. On the clarinet, or even on a couple of places on the oboe, we're going back and forth side to side. So the clarinet, I, I, don't, I don't slide. I go right to left, left to right, right, left, right, left, right, left, and so on. Uh, the bassoon has a couple of things like that, that that help, but it's front and back. So the F sharp and the G sharp can be played on either the front or the back. And you have to base that on how your fingers are going to move, uh, depending on the, the passage. I've got. A, I've written a passage where you can see this in the book, uh, but this is called the pancake key. This big round key we call affectionately the pancake key, and it's okay to slide from the pancake key up to the thumb B flat key above it, or it's okay to slide down to the F sharp key below it. But we never. We have to have our standards. We never. Sl we never slide from the key below the pancake key clear up to the key above the pancake key. <laughs> So if I'm going to go from B flat to F sharp, I wouldn't go B, or F, better way to say that would be A sharp to F sharp. No, that's just too much. And so I'm going to play the A, the A sharp on the back, and I'm going to play the F sharp on the front. Uh, I can also play G sharp on the front, or G sharp on the back. And we will go back and forth if it helps uh, to avoid weird slides. We do a lot of sliding on the bassoon, but we, we want to avoid really weird slides. I want to mention one other thing that's really a, unique to the bassoon. If you play staccato, a 
Watch my mouth. That, that's what it takes to play the staccato. I use the image of a rubber band. It's sitting there round. When you stretch it, when you stretch it, it goes narrow and oblong. That's what's happening with my arms. I've got a rubber band right here under my, under my nose. As I begin to play, I stretch it down. Sides come in. At the end of the note, I have to bring it back. It's open so far that I actually have to move my embouchure for staccato. We don't do that with the other, other instruments. So if I, when I attack it, when I bring it back, if I don't bring it back, that's, what's, that's what I'm talking about for ending the note. You have to make the note end that way. So if I'm just doing any note, I have to do that. If I'm playing staccato, I just have to do it quickly. And it takes a little bit of that action. We don't want any more than we have to have, but I just have to have some. So, uh, vibrato on the oboe bassoon, uh, really it's handled abdominally, just like the flute started in the, uh, in the stomach. <laughs> Pulsations. Faster, it's going to move up into the throat, just like on the flute. So I really think of the flute, oboe, and bassoon with the vibrato working pretty much the same way. But I would start it in the abdominal area, and then as you work speed, it'll move up more sympathetically up to the, up into the throat. Okay, I think that maybe that's enough on the bassoon. I would just say uh, a word about the ethnic flutes and the recorders and so on. I don't think I'm going to demonstrate anything on those instruments, but uh, it's not uncommon for a woodwind doubler to have to be able to play recorders. I have a whole set of recorders from bass, recorder, tenor, alto, soprano, and sopranino. I also have to do sometimes uh, penny whistles. I have a whole set of whistles. Uh, different keys, and also have the high whistles and the low whistles. And then it's also necessary sometimes to play uh, Native American flute or uh, shakuhachi, Japanese, or kana, South American, or even Chinese flutes, the, the D. Uh, so uh, I would recommend that you, if you're going to be a complete doubler, that you look at those instruments. I think we won't hear. I do talk about them a little bit in the book. Uh, I've also spent quite a bit of time with the EWI, the electronic wind instrument. It's like a synthesizer with a, with a saxophone key. It's really just a controller because it controls tone modules uh, with a saxophone keyboard and it responds to breath and it can respond to tonguing. Uh, so it's kind of cool because you can do things that you can't do with a, with a keyboard controller. Uh, but that would be a, an optional kind of thing. Probably not necessary to talk about it. There's a lot more in the book I really think is very important that you check out this chapter on the book if you're a serious doubler. There's a lot of information there. I've only covered a few of the things that I felt like you needed to have a sound example, a sound demonstration so you hear it. Uh, or, or a visual thing where you can see it too. Uh, some, like flicking, you just got to see it to see how it works. Uh, hopefully that's uh, uh, helpful, some good stuff. With all the instruments, um, uh, all the like f clarinet, flute, oboe, and bassoon. I've listed method books, solos, uh, things that you can play uh, to develop, and I've also listed people you can listen to and pieces that you can listen to. So you can check those out in the book as well. So uh, this kind of does it. Uh, I hope that this has been valuable to you and uh, wish you all the best as you go forward. Happy, happy saxophoning, happy doubling if you if you get into this doubling thing, it's, a, it's very rewarding, but it's also very frustrating. <laughs> Be ready for some frustration, but I think you'll love it. Anyway, I hope that these videos have been of some help to you. The book will be even, even more help to you. Check it out, Ray Smith Saxophone Pedagogy Book. It's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Outskirts Press, uh, almost any of the places you'd normally be able to buy books. So thank you. I appreciate you watching and appreciate you uh, 
subscribing to the channel. Uh, I will probably add some things from time to time, so do subscribe. And uh, I do thank you. Have a good day.